Donc je pense que nous allons maintenant euh, commencer cette, euh, cette soirée euh, dont nous attendons tous beaucoup, car nous recevons aujourd'hui, euh, euh, mes chers amis, euh, le professeur David Greber pour une grande conférence du Collège de France qui a été organisée par la Fondation Hugo du Collège de France et Florence terras Rioux, que je remercie. Je tiens aussi à remercier Sandrine Trainer et France Culture de relayer et d'amplifier ces conférences à travers un partenariat plus général qui renforce notre action de diffusion des savoirs, puisque c'est une mission de service public pour la maison. Est-ce que c'est un simple hasard du calendrier Cette soirée coïncide avec le 50e anniversaire du mouvement du 22 mars 1968, qui est né à l'Université de Nanterre, à partir des activités du Comité Vietnam, car ce fut à l'origine... Euh, ce fut l'origine internationale d'un mouvement qui immédiatement s'est métissé de revendications sociétales plus libertaires, en particulier dans le domaine des sexualités. Même si l'entrée dans la danse des syndicats ouvriers a vite donné une allure plus classique à cette révolte, la vague de libération des mœurs qui s'en est suivie a marqué toute une génération. Et la déferlante conservatrice, qui a semblé clore cet épisode de quatre mois, n'a pas empêché Simone Veil, dans un gouvernement de droite, de faire légaliser en 1972 le droit à l'interruption volontaire de grossesse. Mai 1968 était bien passé par là. Mais rien n'est définitivement acquis, et ceux qui restent favorables à ces libertés doivent rester vigilants. Les positions bruyantes et homophobes au mariage pour tous en France, ou les succès remportés dans tous les pays USA en tête par les militants violemment hostile à l'avortement médicalisé, le démontre suffisamment. Pour revenir à vous, cher David Greber, vous êtes connu pour votre rôle dans le mouvement Occupy Wall Street, réponse militante à la crise financière qui éclata en 2007. Même s'il faut bien admettre, ce mouvement a fait pchit, et c'est toujours Wall Street qui nous occupe, et même nous préoccupe. Mais vous êtes d'abord un anthropologue, ayant fait son terrain à Madagascar, Doctorant de Marshall Salins, dont, jeune étudiant, j'avais apprécié la critique de la sociobiologie. On retrouve peut-être dans votre critique de la biologisation ou naturalisation du mondialisme économique contemporain une marque de l'influence de Salins, lui-même présent à Paris en 1968 et militant actif contre la guerre du Vietnam. Vous êtes l'auteur de nombreux ouvrages très engagés, dont « Bureaucratie », récemment traduit en français, on ne peut pas en épouser toutes les thèses. Mais vous y donnez des pistes utiles pour comprendre pourquoi les classes sociales qui votaient traditionnellement à gauche ou à l'extrême gauche se réfugient aujourd'hui dans l'abstention ou apportent leur suffrage aux politiciens de droite et pas seulement aux USA. Ce phénomène mondial est très inquiétant. Vous avez développé la thèse que le libéralisme qui se donne les couleurs de la lutte contre la bureaucratie a, en fait, développé une bureaucratie sans précédent. Et vous tâchez d'expliquer en économiste, en homme politique et en historien les ressorts cachés de ce paradoxe apparent. Je n'insiste pas. Vous y reviendrez peut-être dans votre conférence. Et si vous n'y revenez pas, j'espère que cela apparaîtra dans les échanges avec Philippe Descola, lui aussi anthropologue. Sinon, ce sera pour une autre fois. Vous m'avez amusé, toujours dans bureaucratie, par votre déception de ne pas avoir encore vu les voitures volantes annoncées par les films de science-fiction des années 70. Pourtant, des objets de peu d'imagination, simple prolongation de ce que nous connaissons déjà. Gardons-nous de penser comme des bureaucrates. Ce n'est pas en améliorant la bougie qu'on a inventé l'électricité, disait un slogan du mouvement Sauvant la science. Pareillement, et vous en parlez curieusement peu, les révolutions récentes dans le transfert d'informations, inimaginables en 1970, et qui ont changé notre vie, y compris à Wall Street, ne se sont pas faites en améliorant le téléphone à cadran de ma jeunesse, plutôt par l'application des travaux de théoriciens et expérimentateurs qui ne pensaient certainement pas au téléphone portable ou au GPS dans leur laboratoire de physique quantique. » 
Ce qui n'empêche pas le scientifique, que je suis, de retrouver dans votre critique de la bureaucratie bien des échos de ce qu'il subit quotidiennement. Une analyse sociologique est encore manquante de la cité scientifique et des règles et structures qui la gouvernent, ou qui la vous gouvernent plutôt, vont parfois à l'encontre de cette valeur de la science si chère à point carré. Une telle analyse sociologique apporterait très certainement de l'eau à votre moulin. De là à embrasser les thèses anarchistes de Feyerabend, il y a un pas que vous me permettrez de ne pas franchir. Mais il est temps de vous laisser la place et de vous remercier, puisque je n'ai pas encore fait, d'avoir répondu à notre invitation. Alors. Notre administrateur a presque tout dit déjà, donc ma tâche sera facile. Euh, cela dit, il est difficile de présenter euh, David Graeber tant il a de cordes à son arc. Euh, Alain Prochian l'a dit, c'est un anthropologue, un anthropologue euh, qui euh, enseigne dans l'un des temples de l'anthropologie mondiale au département d'anthropologie de l'université de la, de la London School of Economics, fondée par Malinowski. Euh, C'est l'un des plus lus dans le monde. Il est commenté non seulement par ses collègues, mais aussi par les étudiants, d'une extraordinaire productivité, non pas seulement en termes de pages publiées, euh, mais aussi en, et surtout peut-être en termes d'imagination théorique. Euh, un, un anthropologue euh, euh, David Sutton dans un compte-rendu d'un livre de David Graeber avait dit la chose suivante je, vous, je le cite s'il existait en anthropologie un index du nombre d'idées par page Graeber serait sans doute tout au sommet et c'est vrai donc c'est un anthropologue avec une carrière en apparence classique peut-être eu quelques démêlés à l'université de Yale où ses positions politiques lui ont valu euh, de ne pas rester, euh, mais par ailleurs, euh, il a enseigné dans les plus grandes universités à Goldsmith avant d'être à, 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 à la London School of Economics. Euh, à l'approche, on se l'a dit, il a fait sa thèse avec une des figures les plus importantes, pour moi peut-être la plus importante, euh, du, dans, le, dans la galaxie anthropologique contemporaine, Marshall Salins, cette thèse elle était fondée sur un terrain à Madagascar, sur la persistance des divisions sociales entre les descendants de nobles et les descendants d'esclaves dans une population du centre de Madagascar. C'est un travail qui va devenir une monographie en 2007 sous le titre « Lost People ». Et les, au fond, les principaux thèmes de, de, de recherche auxquels David Graeber a consacré euh, ses recherches par la suite sont déjà présents dans ce livre de façon explicite ou quelquefois en filigrane. Je pense à la théorie de l'échange, à la question des fondements de l'inégalité sociale, aux sources du pouvoir et de la domination, à la dimension religieuse des organisations hiérarchiques, à la question de l'origine de l'État. Et ces thèmes, il les abordera ensuite de façon tout à fait systématique dans une demi-douzaine d'ouvrages qui sont à la fois des ouvrages savants et accessibles au plus grand nombre, euh, qui fourmillent d'intuitions dont chacune pourrait fournir la matière d'une vie entière de recherche, appuyée sur une documentation ethnographique et historique que très peu de chercheurs sont en mesure de mobiliser. On en a eu un exemple ce matin, David Graeber et David Wengrow m'ont fait le plaisir de participer à mon séminaire euh, sur des questions très techniques concernant l'esclavage dans les populations amérindiennes de Californie et on a pu mesurer au cours de cette discussion effectivement l'immensité du savoir dont David Graeber peut faire preuve. Je mentionnerai que quelques-uns de ses livres, peut-être l'un des premiers c'est Towards an Anthropological Theory of Value qui a été publié en 2001 et qui introduit un thème qui va courir comme un leitmotiv dans l'œuvre de David Graeber, c'est la différence entre la valeur au sens économique et monétaire, et les valeurs comme ce à quoi une société tient et la façon dont les deux peuvent être rapprochés éventuellement dans une théorie de la valeur des biens. Autre livre qu'Alain Prochian a mentionné tout à l'heure, « Debt, the first 5,000 years », qui a été traduit en français, 
euh, un livre qui a connu un immense succès mondial et dans lequel euh, David Graeber montre que l'endettement est depuis très longtemps au fond une construction sociale fondatrice du pouvoir, avant même d'ailleurs que euh, la monnaie euh, émerge. Un autre livre aussi, c'est celui euh, que, euh, auquel euh, euh, Alain Prochian faisait référence sur la bureaucratie, qui en anglais était « The Utopia of Rules », consacré à cette malédiction contemporaine dont David Graeber montre qu'elle est devenue non le moyen, mais d'une certaine façon la fin du développement technologique, la fin FIN comme l'objectif. Et enfin, un livre qui vient de sortir il y a quelques mois, On Kings, publié chez Hawk, donc qui est accessible pour ceux d'entre vous qui s'intéressent directement en ligne, écrit avec Marshall Salins, et qui porte sur un thème tout à fait classique de l'anthropologie, mais qui est fondamental, c'est celui de la royauté divine. Comment est-ce qu'un individu en vient à incarner, euh, au fond, une divinité et à exercer un pouvoir par euh, cette euh, incarnation Donc une œuvre scientifique imposante pour un homme encore jeune, cher David, mais qui a fait de lui une des grandes figures de l'anthropologie mondiale. Mais évidemment, David... Weber n'est pas un savant enfermé dans une tour d'ivoire, c'est aussi, on l'a dit, et vous le savez tous, un militant politique, anticapitaliste, sans doute plus connu par le grand public pour son engagement dans des mouvements comme Occupy Wall Street que par ses œuvres savantes sur la royauté divine ou sur Madagascar. Et pourtant, dans ce domaine aussi, il est un théoricien, avec des ouvrages comme, en particulier, « Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology », dont on parlera peut-être tout à l'heure, ou bien « Direct Action and Ethnography ». Ce dernier livre est très intéressant parce qu'il est construit comme un journal de terrain réflexif d'un militant engagé dans une série d'actions contre la globalisation dans lequel David, en ethnographe consommé, au fond, tire les leçons euh, plus général de l'engagement, de, de la participation politique, dont il est à la fois acteur et observateur. C'est vraiment l'observation participante telle qu'on l'a définie dans l'ethnographie classique. Et au fond, peut-être est-il absurde d'ailleurs de séparer les deux versants, de séparer le militant du théoricien, de l'œuvre et de l'action, puisque les livres de David Graeber sont des livres... Enfin, ces livres savants sont des livres politiques de part en part, et ces livres politiques sont remarquablement savants. Et au fond, il n'y a pas une action politique dans laquelle il se soit euh, engagé, qui n'ait fourni la matière de réflexion théorique profonde, et il n'est pas une de ces réflexions théoriques qui ne contienne l'esquisse d'un programme d'action. C'est ce qu'on va pouvoir vérifier dans un, dans un instant avec... Euh, les réflexions que David Graeber va nous livrer sur ce qu'il appelle les « bullshit jobs », les, les boulots à la con, les boulots foireux. Et euh, c'est l'objet d'un livre euh, qui est euh, en, sous, enfin, sous presse, qui va sortir euh, très prochainement en anglais euh, et qui va fournir l'amorce de notre conversation sur le thème plus général du, du, du travail. Alors, bien évidemment, on l'a dit tout à l'heure, ce n'est pas un hasard si cette conférence se tient le 22 mars. Euh, L'un des mots d'ordre que j'ai le plus apprécié en mai 68 et qui est aux, aux antipodes de l'entreprise de patrimonialisation pieuse auquel ce mouvement est soumis en ce moment, euh, c'est « Soyez réaliste, demandez l'impossible ». Mais à qui demander l'impossible, au fond Je pense qu'il faut d'abord se demander l'impossible à soi-même avant de demander aux autres comme une, 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 une réclamation, en quelque sorte, hein. Et au fond, c'est une injonction à conceptualiser l'impossible afin de le rendre réel. Et je pense que nul mieux que David Graeber n'est en mesure de nous aider à faire cela. Et c'est une opération qui est à la fois importante et urgente. David, the floor is yours. Notre conversation, là, la, la conférence sera en anglais, et puis notre conversation sera en anglais aussi, mais vous avez des, des, des écouteurs pour euh, la traduction. Merci. Yes, well, this lecture marks the 50th anniversary at the beginning of the events that came to be known as May 68, and it's going to be considered the most 
dramatic moment of what Emanuel Wallerstein referred to as the world revolution of 1968. And I, I imagine I'm here in part because of my own somewhat modest role in what's been, he also calls the world revolution of 2011. Uh, so I thought it might be appropriate to consider some of the things that have changed between the two. 68 is often presented as um, sort of the last magnificent gasp of the insurrectionary dream that so many people had had of intellectuals and workers making common cause to rise up against bureaucracies of both state and capital. Um, and its aftermath saw the lighting of a kind of conceptual bonfire in which almost all the tenets of previous radical orthodoxy, particularly Marxist orthodoxy, but not only that, were thrown out one by one. Uh, dialectics, alienation, emancipation, critique. Um, above all, the notion of a revolutionary subject, whether the proletariat or eventually almost any other potential candidate as re for revolutionary subject from the people to humanity itself, um, which put those inclined to rise up against the system in an obviously uncomfortable position of not knowing precisely in whose name they were actually rising up. Um, there have been a variety of efforts, of course, to solve this problem, uh, from the post-workerist notion of the multitude to the more recent 99%, which it's something to do with. Um, but rather than offer a critical appraisal of these, um, I thought it'd be more interesting to start by looking at the sort of movements that have emerged leading up to 2011, starting with those I've been able to observe most closely because I've been involved with them myself, um, from the alter globalization movement of movements to Occupy Wall Street, and consider some of their common features to understand what's actually changed in, in the possibility of popular mobilization between the two periods. Um, why they've taken the form that they have. Generally, these are not proletarian movements in the classic sense of the term, although they almost invariably contain very strong support from working class organizations. But neither are they really identity-based. Um, most seem to be organized around two poles. Um, there's a kind of activist core. Um, and that activist core remains fairly constant in its social composition over time. It's interesting that the, the social composition of revolutionary vanguards is remarkably similar to that of artistic bohemians. Um, it's the same sort of meeting place of, of downwardly mobile children of the professional classes who sort of reject their parents' values and upwardly mobile children of the popular classes, um, working class in particular, who sort of get a bourgeois education and then discover to their frustration that getting a bourgeois education doesn't mean you actually get to be part of the bourgeoisie. I mean, I, I would be a textbook example of this latter category. Um, and I found that, you know, when you do analysis of who, who the people were in direct action movements from the alter globalization movement onwards, the key organizers, it always was a sort of meeting place of those two groups. Um, what's really critical, however, is the changing nature of the sort of the second element, um, the, the primary constituency or support base. That's interesting. Uh, for such movements, which is still somewhat opaque during the alter globalization movement, be became really apparent a decade later um, as a class of, of care, what I would describe as caregivers. Um, in the broadest possible definition, as anyone who saw their work primarily as helping, caring for, or furthering the development or flourishing of other human beings. Um, I had a problem translating this concept, the caring classes, into French for the title, uh, since there really isn't a term in French for this. So I kind of went to some of my, my uh, Francophone feminist friends and, and sort of had a little contest for who could come up with the best one. And I think the two winners were um, Nafe Crandimeyer suggested a class empathique, um, rather than uh, affective. Um, but but um, my favorite, perhaps, is uh, Holly Wood, uh, who suggested that we could talk about travail de coeur, and that's the courgeoisie. Um, it's the caring glasses. 
Maybe it'll catch on. Um, anyway, I was particularly struck when surveying some of the online documents. Uh, there was something called the We Are the 99% Tumblr page, which was created in the early days of Occupy, uh, where supporters who were too busy working to actually take part in occupations uh, could express their solidarity by holding up little signs. Uh, they'd write out car placards with a story of their life and situation, and it always end with, I am the 99%, um, why they supported the movement. There are thousands of these, and I once spent a whole weekend going through each and every one of them, trying to you know, get at the patterns behind. And about 75% of them were women, but what was really interesting is even the men were almost invariably engaged in some kind of helping or caring profession. They were in t uh, education, they were in health, social service provision, taking care of disabled people, things like that. Um, some field which directly involved helping others. And, and the complaints expressed were about the irony of the situation. This happened over and over again. People were essentially saying, I wanted to do something useful with my life. I wanted to have a job where I would actually do benefit others um, through my work. And I found that if you want to take care of other people, they will pay you so little and put you so much in debt that you can't take care of your own family. And it's, it's the irony and the contradiction of that situation which really underlined the anger that, that um, lay behind the movement. Um, now, this is how I first came to think of Occupy as, as the revolt of the caring classes. Uh, but thinking that way, I think, raised a series of important questions about the changing organization of work and the changing organization of capitalism itself, um, and, and also ideas, above all, about what is valuable in work that are really important if we're going to think about what a social movement, what a working class movement in particular would be under the current um, the form that capitalism currently takes. So let me speak briefly about that. I, I will have to set forth arguments that I've developed in more detail elsewhere, and I'm not going to be able to provide any evidence for anything, so I'm just going to make a series of flat-out declarations. You'll have to take my word for it. Um, what seems to have happened is that starting in the 1970s and 80s, there has been a shift in the nature of the capitalist classes, that where there had been an opposition between finance and the sort of upper echelons of corporate bureaucracies, increasingly those two classes became the same social class. People moved back and forth between finance and um, corporate positions. Um, they started intermarrying. They, they bureaucratized the, the f finance at the same time as financializing corporations. Um, so there's a kind of a new ruling Class. That, that ruling class, in turn, led to a change in the relation of state and capital, that whereby under you know, sort of classic capitalism, you have the state as the guarantor of property rights through which one can you know, get one's profits through making and selling things. Um, Financialization, uh, increasing reliance on rent taking and the artificial creation of debt meant that uh, the state actually played a more and more integral role in the extraction of surplus value. Uh, that is to say, it, you know, dural political means uh, became the very means of the pro extraction of profits. Uh, it has become the case in America, for example, that in, even in large manufacturing corporations and General Electric, a car manufacturers, actually the, the profits come from the financial division. And of course finance operates entirely through the legal system. So, so the, the, the state becomes the means actually of extracting surpluses, which means that corporate bureaucracies and state bureaucracies increasingly fuse and become essentially the same thing. It becomes impossible to tell where one really starts and where the other ends. Um, this was obviously most dramatically illustrated in the too big to fail bailouts of 2008, but it's become a basic feature of, of the new economic order. Now, all of this had really profound effects on the organization of the workforce. Um, a popular discourse starting in the 80s, oh, everybody talked about was the rise of the service economy. But I think this discourse is very deceptive. Um, in fact, if you look at actual service providers in the classic sense of the term, you know, people who cut hair, who serve coffee. The actual numbers have not changed. Um, I've, I've seen statistics which show they've remained 
pretty much constant at 20%. And they dip to 18, they go up to 22. Uh, but they stay pretty much around 20% for the last 100 years. There's really been no change in the number of service workers. There's been a change that less of them work in private households. Uh, but the, their actual numbers are about the same. What's really changed dramatically is the number of clerical, administrative, information, and supervisory workers, which have just ballooned, I mean tripled easily, um, probably more than that, over the last 50 years. Um, and the remarkable thing about many of these jobs, and this includes whole new industries like corporate law, telemarketing, lobbying, university administration, um, that have expanded enormously, or some have been created wholesale in recent years, is that huge proportions of people who work in them, in fact, the vast majority, according to a lot of surveys, are personally convinced that their jobs are completely pointless that if their jobs did not exist, it would make no difference whatsoever. This is what I refer to as bullshit jobs. Um, and this latter is my most surprising discovery of my own research on work, which was carried out at first in a relatively haphazard fashion, less as part of my academic work, really, than, than part of my political work. It long struck me that many of the standard justifications for capitalist inequalities basically no longer stand. Um, you know, arguments based on capitalism producing rising living standards for the poor, a growing and politically stable middle class, the rapid technological advance. All of this is really obviously no longer the case. Um, so in fact, the existing order is really held together more than anything else, well, by the idea that no alternative is possible, of course, but also by my moral imperatives. Um, and and so, Probably the two most powerful and effective of these are the morality of work and the morality of debt. And in fact, I've effectively written one book on each of them, trying to understand the opponent's strengths, as it were. Um, my research on the morality of debt was essentially a political intervention to try to understand why it is that people universally seem to feel that people who do not pay their debts, no matter what the conditions under which the debt was contracted, are immoral and, and, and that debts must be paid. Um, but very similarly, there seems to be a almost universal belief that people who don't work harder than they really want to be working at something they don't particularly like are essentially bad people and do not deserve the love and support of their communities. Um, and this is a really powerful idea. And it's a really difficult thing for people to overcome when they're doing political organizing. Um, now. This very moral impulse has produced really perverse and paradoxical situations where enormous percentages of the workforce are convinced that they're employed by at absolutely nothing. Um, were their jobs to disappear, it would make real, no significant difference. But at the same time, it has not become come to be seen as a social problem. The original piece I wrote in this regard uh, was called On the Phenomena of Bullshit Jobs. And uh, I wrote it in two, 2013. It was an experiment, really, more than anything else. I wasn't entirely even sure whether the premise that I was setting out was true. Um, what, what I suggested was that the reason why Keynes's famous prediction that by around this time we would all be working 15-hour weeks never ended up coming about um, was not because what he described as technological unemployment back in the 30s, not because that hadn't occurred, um, but because it did occur, but that people had essentially made up jobs, uh, that, that our economy is organized in such a way that we simply can't redistribute or cho chose not to redistribute um, the, the available leisure hours. Um, and it seemed to me that this situation was extraordinarily convenient politically. Um, as George Orwell put it, uh, uh, a population busy working, even at completely useless occupations, doesn't have time to do much else. Um, so I, I wrote this as a political piece, and, and I said, well, if nothing else, this is the reason nobody seems to want to do anything about the situation. It's awfully convenient to people in power. I mean, look at what happened in the 60s, where there was a, rel back in 68, in fact, there was a, a relatively secure population um, with a certain amount of leisure time on their hands. Um, and it does seem like people were terrified at the time that tech 
uh, robots were going to replace workers, were, you know, everyone was going to turn into hippies, and um, the, the so existing social order was under terrible threat. Um, so perhaps this is part of the key to the question. Um, I was accused, of course, of, of being a conspiracy theorist in this regard, but I thought of it more of as an anti-conspiracy theory um, speculation, because what I was really trying to understand was not why this happened, why so many useless jobs happened, but why no one did anything about it. You'd think this would be considered a social problem, but it's never discussed as a social problem at all. Um, what really surprised me after I wrote this piece uh, was the reaction. Um, it was written almost as an experiment, and I really didn't have any idea how many of these bullshit jobs there really were. Um, but I wrote the piece in a relatively obscure venue, a very obscure venue, actually, a strike magazine, uh, a newly founded anarchist uh, online magazine. Within, I believe, a week, this piece had been translated into 12 different languages. Uh, it went viral across the world. I was getting messages from everywhere saying, oh, I'm in the financial services industry. I've got this across my desk 20 times today, uh, which, if nothing else, shows that people in that industry aren't really doing very much. Um, <laughs> And um, it went instantly viral. Uh, before long, I was seeing it was running as, uh, in, in newspapers around the world, and there were blogs, where comment sections, where people were making these terrible confessions. You know, yes, it's true. I'm I'm a corporate lawyer. I I I, I make no uh, contribute nothing to society. I'm miserable all the time. <laughs> this sort of thing. Um, and um, so I realized that something was going on. Eventually, um, there were surveys, and there's been one survey based on the piece in the UK, and another one in Holland. And both came up with almost identical results. Uh, between 37 and 40% of all employees actually agree that their jobs are completely pointless and shouldn't exist. <laughs> and that's actually, if you think about it, um, the actual number of useless employment is probably even higher than that, because you know, they could be wrong, but I'm going to assume people, if anybody knows, they would, right? Um, I. I it must be higher because think of all the people who are you know, cleaning the offices where people are doing nothing or you know, watering the plants, providing security and pest control. They're doing real work, but they're doing real work in support of nothing. So, so, so that work could be eliminated as well. So I think we could easily get rid of 50% of the work we do of no ill effects. Um, all right, so what are the reasons this happened? Um, I think they're complex, but I think they're directly related to financialization. Um, I have myself coined the term managerial feudalism to describe the endless multiplication of intermediate levels of administration, uh, whether it's the dramatic increase of administrative staff in universities, something I have to deal with all the time, um, since reorganizing education on corporate grounds has largely meant shifting power to a kind of faux executive class of administrators who immediately insist you know, of course, if I'm an important person, I should have a little army of, of flunkies, you know, of, of four or five, six people whose main jobs seem to be to make them look important, but they hire them and then they figure out what they're going to do, right? So then they produce all sorts of forms and surveys and time allocation studies for people like me to fill out, um, which leads to the sort of bullshitization of, of real jobs, which is a, another really significant um, matter. I, I've seen one survey saying, about less than half of what the average American office worker does during the day actually relates to what they consider their real work. Um, so in addition to that, I mean, that's a classic example. Um, you can find, think of corporate middle management, the creative industries where you have producers, curators, there's all these sort of intermediary ranks being created between uh, the people with the money and the people who actually do the work. Um, and um, one of the really surprising things in my own research, because I ended up gathering hundreds of accounts of people with bullshit jobs, and um, a fascinating thing was, was the intensity of the misery and social suffering these jobs create. Uh, because you know, it's a, the clearest indication that economistic theories of human nature are wrong, right? Because essentially, these people should be incredibly happy. They're getting something for nothing. They walk in, half of them are just playing you know, fruit mahjong all day or distributing cat memes. They're getting paid good salaries, and they're utterly miserable. 
um, you know, because they, they talk about psychosomatic illnesses, uh, these terrible workplace conditions where people are just abusing each other, um, uh, suffering all the more acute because um, there's almost no acceptable way to talk about it um, or, or to even tell people why it feels bad. Um, this raises as a very interesting questions also about popular theories of value. Uh, because obviously, if a worker believes that a well-compensated administrative position is socially worthless, and people will talk about this job has no social value, they'll often use that phrase, um, it means that she believes there actually is some standard for measuring worth other than the market. Uh, in fact, that the market can get it extraordinarily wrong. Um, in fact, not only does the market assessment of the value of different forms of work not correspond to popular conceptions of what they actually contribute to society, uh, there actually seems to be an inverse relation. And this is very important. With few exceptions, the principle seems to be that the more one's work is socially useful or is seen to be socially useful by the people doing it, the more it's recognized as helping others, the less one is likely to be paid for it. I mean, there are a few, a few well-known exceptions, but the rule does generally hold. Um, I should emphasize that this is not simply an effect of supply and demand. You know, when I first pointed this out, some people said, oh, well, that's just the diamonds and water paradox, right? Um, it's just a matter of, you know, it's a matter of supply and demand di uh, dynamics, but that's not, in fact, the case. Um, if society really was governed by a market logic, um, well, for example, the United States for the last few years has been experiencing an acute shortage of trained nurses and an actual glut of corporate lawyers. On the other hand, this has really not affected the salaries each get at all. Um, so really supply demand doesn't seem to have to do with it. Um, clearly the real reasons for the price of labor um, as actually the price of most things is only marginally related to the market. They say that the market really determines about 20% of the price of most commodities, and that's probably true of jobs as well. Um, it's much more a matter of institutional and class power. Um, but what really struck me as interesting is, is the degree to which so many people seem to feel that this was right, that people who do socially useful work should be paid less. There's a kind of confusion about it. I mean, they feel bad about it when it happens to themselves. But when talking in the abstract, there did seem to be a sense that um, perhaps the most well-articulated example would be attitudes towards primary or secondary school teachers, um, who it's often said should not be paid too much money because you don't really want people motivated primarily by money to be teaching our children, right? Um, <laughs> But this, this is seen to be extended more generally. It's not just that uh, employers feel, and this is increasingly true in many places, that feel that if there's a task that anyone would conceivably do for any reason other than money, you know, even if it's something like graphic design or translation work, there should be some way they could figure out not to have to pay for it. Um, but it, there's also a feeling that those who enjoy their work or even are able to take satisfaction in the fact that their work does indeed help others shouldn't be paid, or at least shouldn't be paid very much. Um, it's only people who are working only for the money who actually deserve to get a lot of money. Um, <laughs> it, it's almost as if the, you know, the old stoic di dictum that virtue is its own reward or should be its own reward has become a guiding principle of economic life. Um, it seems to me that these sentiments have dramatic political repercussions. I genuinely believe it's impossible to understand the politics of austerity without understanding these dynamics. So in the UK, for instance, we've had eight years of austerity now, nine maybe, um, which have seen an effe effective pay cuts to almost all of those who provide immediate and obvious benefits to the public, whether this be nurses, bus drivers, firefighters, you know, railroad information booth workers, you know, so any emergency medical personnel, it's come to the point where there are full-time nurses who are actually dependent on charity food banks. Um, yet creating the situation has become such a point of pride for the party in power that you know, the parliamentarians often have been known to give out collective cheers on voting down bills which have been proposed to sort of give nurses or even police a raise. Um, the same party, of course, took a notoriously indulgent view of the sharply rising compensation for city bankers who had just crashed the world economy in 2008. Um, 
Yet that government remained highly popular. Um, there is a sense, it would seem, that an ethos of collective sacrifice for the common good should fall disproportionately on those who are already, by their choice of line of work, engaged in sacrifice for the common good. One result is that national politics in most countries, and this I think is a very, very insidious result of all of this, have come to be organized around a complex play of often unstated resentments. Indeed, the, you could say that societies are increasingly held together by resentments of certain kinds. Those stuck in bullshit jobs resent those sections of the working class who have traditionally productive labor or whose work clearly helps others. Hence, for instance, the, the strange antipathy, the anger directed in the United States against unionized auto workers, um, not against auto executives. When they had to you know, bail out the auto industry and they bailed out the banks, they didn't have to make the bankers take any pay cuts. But when they bailed out the auto industry, they made the workers take a pay cut. And there seemed to be a lot of support for this. And people were saying, well, what are they getting paid $42 an hour to make cars? Um, there seemed to be this sense that, well, you get real work. You know, you get to make cars. That should be, shouldn't that be enough for you? You want, like, benefits and vacations, too? Um, <laughs> and um, similarly with teachers. Um, I've actually talked to right-wing organizers who said, you know, when we started the, the education campaigns, we tried to target school administrators, but that didn't really take. But then we started complaining about the teachers, and everybody got really excited. <laughs> um, so teachers actually teach. You know, it's a rewarding activity, and, and, and there seemed to be a sense that um, for them to demand other things as well seemed, was unreasonable. So there's a resentment on the part of people with bullshit jobs, of people who have real, actual, productive, or helping jobs. Um, at the same time, there is a resentment on the part of the working class, many of whom do, in fact, have um, real productive jobs, for what they call the liberal elite. And this is you know, very dramatic in America. This is why we have people like Bush and then Trump. Um, but um, it is a phenomenon that can be observed in most places. I was wondering for years why it is so many working class people, I mean, they don't like rich people all that much, right? But, but they seem to hate intellectuals more. And, um, and I thought about this for years, and I, then I thought, you know, there's two slogans that seem to most motivate people, that are most effective slogans of right-wing populists, and, and one of them is the sort of we hate the liberal elite, and the other one is support the troops. There is this idea that you must have give unwavering loyalty to soldiers, especially foot soldiers. Officers are never quite so sure. Um, well, why is that? Um, you know, it didn't seem to have much to do with each other. And I suddenly realized, well, you know, it does make a certain amount of sense. Because say you are an air conditioner repairman in uh, Nebraska. You know, you can imagine a situation in which a child of yours could become rich. It's not very likely. You know that. But it could happen. But basically, there's just no way that, no matter how smart your kid is, they will ever become drama critic for the New York Times or an international human rights lawyer. It's just not going to happen. Right? The barriers are much, much higher. Um, so on the other hand, and if you look at the kind of jobs from which people call the liberal elite and, and from which people are locked out, they're basically jobs which involve the pursuit of some value other than money in which you do actually get well compensated. So if you look at um, the pursuit, you know, it's an argument about nobility. If you look at the pursuit of truth, beauty, you know, truth as in journalism, beauty, art, the arts, charity work, um, almost anything uh, involving values as opposed to simply economic value, uh, higher education, um, literature, activism and human rights, um, any of these things, if you want to actually do that and get paid, well, there's this whole rigmarole you have to go through of uh, university training. You have to do unpaid internships and live in a city like San Francisco and New York on no money for two years. Basically, unless you are part of that class of people who are already doing that, um, forget it. You can't. Um, this is why I think Hollywood has become the sort of symbol of the liberal elite. There was a time, you know, even back in the 30s, where people believed Hollywood is the land of opportunity. I don't know whether it was true, but it was a 
commonly believed idea, uh, sort of farm girl could go and be discovered and suddenly become a star. Nowadays, you know, you look at a movie and everybody in it is as a genealogy three generations back of, of actors and producers. They're an in-marrying cast. And then if those guys go off and claim to care about the common man, you know, like, come on. Um, <laughs> so you can understand right-wing objections. Um, so, so if you are that, that air conditioner repairman's child you know, from Nebraska and you want to do some, get well payment and benefits to do something noble, what can you do? You can join the army. Uh, that's basically it. Um, so the idea of support the troops and hate we hate the liberal elites is actually the same concept. Um, now, so these kind of resentments, the resentment of the sort of people in the bullshit jobs, the professional managerial classes, or working class people, the, the, the resentment of working class people for, for the liberal elite, and other resentments as well, sort of hold society together. And you can't really understand the rise of right-wing populism without that. Um, for example, in the US, it becomes very much racialized because immigrants and African Americans are among the only group of working class people who aren't anti-intellectual and do see the educational system as a potential means of advance rather than resenting it. So it reinforces the kind of po uh, populist racism. Um, Anyway, um, the question then becomes, how can you reconstitute working class politics in this situation? It's, it's clearly a disastrous state of affairs. Um, but I also think that for the most part, intellectuals have done an extremely poor job in analyzing these dynamics, let alone engaging in work that might contribute to supporting an effective opposition. Some key elements in the pic picture, such as the growth of useless employment, have barely been identified as a social problem or been the object of any sustained analysis in their own right. So let me devote the rest of this exposition to thinking about how we might do a better job of thinking our way out of this. Um, I think everything really revolves around different conceptions of value. And I don't think we can fully understand how we've come to accept the idea of there being a moral value in useless employment and the various types of resentments that ensue about it. Um, crucially, I think we need to consider the history of conceptions of work in what we somewhat dubiously call the Western tradition. Uh, if you go back both to the story of the Garden of Eden in Genesis and, and the Hesiodic myth of Prometheus, they're actually very similar. Um, work in either case is seen as uh, the punishment of humans for their defiance of a divine creator. But at the same time, work is a more modest instantiation of the divine power of creation itself. That is, we're, we are both punished for defying God, but punished by being forced to inter, imitate God in an incredibly unpleasant way, um, to wield the divine power of creation against our own will in a way guaranteed to produce misery. Now, one could argue that this is simply a kind of poetic extrapolation on the two key defining aspects of what we have come to define as work, that work is always defined as something we would not ordinarily wish to be doing for its own sake, hence punishment. Uh, second, that we do it anyway to accomplish something beyond the work itself, that is creation. But the fact that this something beyond the work itself should be conceived as creation is, is not self-evident. In fact, it's, it's somewhat odd. Um, since, after all, if you think about it, most work doesn't really create anything. Um, most of it is a matter of maintaining and rearranging things. Um, I always say, consider a cup of coffee, um, or a coffee cup, excuse me. Uh, you know, we produce a cup once. You know, you ask a Marxist, always give that example, they'll hold up a cup and say, well, you know, how much, like, labor power goes into the production of this cup. But, you know, you produce a cup once, and you wash it, like, a thousand times, right? Um, why do they never talk about the washing of the cup as an example of labor? That's most of the labor we do. Um, even work we do think of as production, growing potatoes, forging a shovel, assembling a computer, could just as easily be seen as tending, transforming, reshaping, or rearranging materials that already exist. Um, this is why I would agree with Professor Descola that our, our conception of production and our assumption that work is defined by its productivity is essentially theological. Um, the Judeo-Christian God created the universe out of nothing, um, which is unusual in itself, right? Most gods work with existing materials. Um, 
but his, his latter-day worshipers and their descendants have come to think of themselves as cursed to imitate God in precisely that act of creating things out of nothing. Uh, there's a certain sleight of hand involved, um, I would say, in the way that most human labor, which can't be considered production in any sense, all of that washing and moving of cups, uh, is made to disappear. And, and that sleight of hand is largely affected through gender. Um, you know, if we look at the story of the fall in Genesis, we have God condemning men to till the soil. Uh, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. And women to bear children in similar unhappy circumstances. I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you, you, you will give birth to children. And the fact that it's the same word is, is quite significant. Male productive labor is thus being framed as the equivalent of childbirth, which from a male point of view, not so much a female one, um, can be seen as close to pure creation ex nihilo. You know, the infant just appears fully formed out of nowhere. Um, so it's, it's as close to divine creation as conceived as you're going to witness, but it's also painful and incredibly painful. Um, this conception is still with us, I think, in the way that social sciences speak of production and reproduction. I don't think reproduction is just a coincidence. That's the word we use. Etymologically, the word produce actually comes from the Latin word producere, which means to bring forth or to put out. Um, in English, you can still say, you know, she produced a wallet from her handbag. Um, so you have this idea of these factories sort of pushing stuff out. Then of consumption, you eat it up. Um, both the terms production and reproduction are based on the same core metaphor. Uh, in the one case, objects seem to jump fully formed out of factories. and the other, babies seem to jump fully formed out of women's bodies. In neither of case, of course, is this actually true, right? Uh, but as in so many patriarchal social orders, Men like to conceive themselves as doing socially or culturally what they like to think of women as doing naturally. Production is thus simultaneously a variation of a male fantasy of childbirth and the action of a male creator god who similarly created the entire universe through the sheer power of his mind and words, just as men see themselves as creating the world from their minds and strength and muscles uh, and see that as the essence of work leaving to women most of the actual labor of tidying and maintaining things to make this illusion possible. So these two elements, work as suffering, work as creation, have interacted in, in a variety of ways over the last 2,000 years or so. But in Northern Europe especially, there's a third element. Um, and I think this is typically, but not correctly, identified with Protestantism or Puritanism. Uh, which is a sense of work as educational self-discipline and self-mortification, subtly different than the suffering. Um, its origins are actually not theological at all. Um, and here I think it's crucial to understand that from at least the high Middle Ages onwards, and probably considerably before, Northern Europe was characterized by a phenomenon often called life cycle service. It's surprising how, how rarely people talk about this. Um, where almost everyone, whatever their social class, was expected to spend their youth, and, and youth was generally seen as running from ages of perhaps 14 to 28 or 30, um, working as a paid servant in the household of someone generally unrelated of a slightly higher social class. This was true across the social spectrum. Obviously, we all know about apprentices and journeymen, but it was also true in, in, of, of peasants. Uh, there were servants and husbandry. That's what milkmaids were. Um, and also even true among the nobility. That's how you have pages, ladies-in-waiting. Um, royal courts had gentlemen waiters. The phrase waiter in English actually comes from nobles who were sort of spending their adolescence taking care of the physical needs of the king, emptying his toilet and whatnot. Um, and, and they were both waiting on the king and waiting for their inheritance. Um, so wage labor was, was seen as a stage of life in which one devoted oneself to service, but simultaneously learned the self-discipline and acquired the skills and capital of, required to eventually marry and set up an autonomous household of one's own. Women acquired a dowry, men acquired capital, um, and eventually to employ servants in one's turn. It's no coincidence, I think, that the parts of Europe where life cycle service was the norm are precisely those that did embrace Protestantism, and that the emergence of capitalist social relations in those regions was also marked by self-conscious movements of social reform. It's interesting, as soon as capitalism emerges, the bourgeoisie suddenly becomes obsessed 
with the manners and morality of the working classes. It's, it's, they didn't seem to really care much before, but suddenly it became an obsession. Well, what, it, it makes a lot of sense when you consider the fact that the proletariat, um, which appropriately means people who breed, you know, that's what proletariat actually means, those who have children, um, you know, happens when people basically despair of ever being able to acquire the means to become a fully autonomous adult and get married. They start marrying young and having lots of kids. It's seen as a social scandal. Um, and um, so all of these people are sort of trapped in permanent social adolescence. So there's all these movements of social reforms, like the Puritan movement was called the Reformation of Manners in England, um, which is essentially about teaching these people proper work discipline so that they can become self-sustaining adults, even though they will never become self-sustaining true adults in the medieval sense of the term, and being autonomous heads of household, not dependent on others, and no longer doing wage labor. Um, now, if we examine how these three elements, work as punishment, work as imitation of divine creation, and work as educational mortification and self-discipline have played off against one another over the course of the last couple centuries, it becomes much easier to see how it's become impossible for us to see the current situation, however absurd, as a problem. Time doesn't allow me to present more than a kind of bullet point summary, but uh, again, let me just present my own findings. One of the remarkable things if you go through 19th century texts is just how universally accepted the labor theory of value really became. Um, it you know, first really was embraced by the emerging industrial bourgeoisie around the time of the Industrial Revolution to deploy against the aristocracy and rentier classes, but then even more avidly by the working classes against them. By, over the course of the 19th century, the labor theory of value came to be almost universally accepted uh, in working class circles and even in m politicians. You, you look at speeches by Abraham Lincoln. You know, he sounds like a Marxist. Um, and, and, but it took this very masculine, productivist kind of form. Um, it's perhaps not surprising, considering the generalization of industrial capitalism at the time and the fact that the first worker struggle actually took the form of demands that male heads of household rather than women and children should be employed in the factories. But in America, for instance, uh, where industrial capitalism arrived fairly late, they did em nonetheless embrace the low labor theory of value very much on the popular level. It was called the gospel of work kind of mixed of religious and theological terms. However, the, this productivism, the fact that it, it did focus on create, labor as creation uh, as opposed to other forms, um, I think was its Achilles heel uh, because it allowed a skewed vision of what the working class actually was and what its work largely consisted of. I mean, even today, you know, if you invoke the term working class, it, 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 you it draws up images of guys in overalls, you know, sort of working on production lines. And it's common to hear otherwise intelligent middle-class intellectuals say, well, with the decline of factory works, you know, is there really a working class anymore in countries like Britain or France or America? Um, as if it were somehow ingeniously constructed androids that were driving their buses, trimming their hedges, installing their cables, or changing their grandparents' bedpans. Um, in fact, there never was a time most workers worked in factories. Even in the days of Marx or Dickens, um, working class neighborhoods housed far more maids, boot blacks, dustmen, cooks, nurses, cabbies, school teachers, prostitutes, caretakers, costermongers, than employees in coal mo mines, textile mills, or iron foundries. Um, are these jobs productive? I mean, you could twist it around to say that they are, but it, it takes a lot of work. Um, and it's because of such ambiguities that so these issues have, are regularly brushed aside when people are arguing about value. Um, but I think doing so blinds us to the reality that most working class labor, whether carried out by men or women, and of course most working class people are women, since most people are women, um, you know, looking after people, seeing to their wants and needs, explaining, reassuring, anticipating you know, what a boss wants or is thinking, not to mention caring for monitoring and maintaining plants, animals, machines, and other objects, um, you know, working class labor has always involved that much more than it's involved hammering, carving, hoisting, or harvesting things. Um, and, and it's this framing of labor as being basically production, and particularly factory production, which really allowed the ideological counterattack. And there was a very self-conscious one. 
um, which started in the 1890s in America, um, coincident with the rise of corporate bureaucratic capitalism, which really developed in Germany and America first. Um, during the US Gilded Age, Andrew Carnegie kind of led the charge, with, uh, counterposing the, to the gospel of work what he called the gospel of wealth, um, an insistence uh, that value springs from the minds of entrepreneurs, Workers are a little different than the machines they operate, and self-realization should lie not in what you, your work and production, but in consumption. Uh, and over the last century, this, this counterattack has been so successful that you know, when you say wealth creator, at least in the English-speaking world, people just automatically assume you're talking about rich people and not about workers. So in the 19th century, it would have been exactly the opposite. So this leads to the question of how to validate work. Um, you know, if work is not producing value, if you're not supposed to find your meaning in life through what you produce, why work at all? How do you tell people that work is good uh, and moral? Because you still want to do that. Um, and I think the re result was a fallback on the synthesis of the work. Once you drop out the theology of creation, you still have the theology of work as punishment, and you still have the notion of work as educational self-discipline. And I think this explains an apparently contradictory situation. I call it the paradox of modern work, and it's revealed by the almost every study in the sociology of work has to grapple with the fact that you know, every survey of workers always finds the same thing. First of all, most people's sense of dignity and self-work is indeed caught up on, in working for a living. If they're unemployed, they just lose a sense of self. Uh, on the second hand, most people hate their jobs. So how do you reconcile these two things? Um, few seem to be willing to draw you know, what I think would be the obvious conclusion, that increasingly people find a sense of dignity and self-worth in, in their jobs because they hate them. Uh, as one of my own informants told me after describing how his coworkers would endlessly complain to one another about overwork and office jobs in which they were, in fact, doing almost nothing, um, he said, well, there, there's an intense pressure to value ourselves and others on the basis of how hard we work at something we'd rather not be doing. If you're not destroying your mind and body by paid work, you're not just not living right. And he says, well, I would say this is more common among middle class office workers um, than among, say, migrant farm workers or short order chefs. But even in the latter case, there has been some infiltration of, of this new ethos to the degree that in working class environments, you know, maybe they don't think praise themselves for how much they're miserable at their job, but they do believe that people who avoid, avoid work entirely are rotten people and should probably drop dead. Um, so, so we're constantly bombarded by propaganda, insisting societies besieged by those who want something for nothing, and that the poor, often conceived in racist terms, but not always, are largely poor because they lack the will and discipline to work, and that only those who've worked harder than they'd like to at something they'd rather not be doing, uh, preferably under a harsh taskmaster, deserve respect and consideration from their fellow citizens. As a result, the kind of sadomasochistic element in work, which many remark becomes ever more pronounced, the more the work itself is bereft of meaning and purpose. This is a common theme in a lot of the, the accounts I got, that you know, if you work at something that actually means something, people are relatively civilized to each other. All this kind of abusive behavior of calling people out and screaming at people, is like the, the more meaningless the work, the more harsh and, um, the actual treatment of people is, especially of subordinates. Um, okay, so that sadomastic element um, rather than becoming an ugly, if predictable, side effect of top-down chains of command in the workplace, has actually become a, a central to what validates work itself. Suffering has become a kind of badge of economic citizenship in much the same way as having a home address. Without it, you just have no right to make another claim. So, to sum up, I think bullshit jobs proliferate today in large part because of the peculiar nature of managerial feudalism that has come to dominate wealthy economies and uh, to an increasing degree all economies. I got similar accounts from places like India, Egypt, Brazil. Um, they cause misery because human happiness is always caught up in a sense of having effects on the world, uh, a feeling that which most people, when they speak of their work, express through a language of social value. Yet at the same time, people are aware that the greater the social value a work, work seems to produce, the less one's likely to be paid for it. Millions are thus faced with this terrible choice between doing something useful and, and 
you know, like taking care of children, but being effectively told that the gratification of helping others should be its own reward, and it's up to them to figure out how to pay the bills, or accepting pointless and degrading work that destroys their mind, mind and body for no particular reason other than a widespread feeling that if one doesn't do so, engage in labor that destroys the mind or body, one doesn't deserve to live. In, in the 19th century, the great pioneer of this sort of contemporary conception of work, I think, is Thomas Carlyle, who really talked about work as a value of itself. Carlyle believed that God had intentionally left the world unfinished to allow us to partake in, in, in the divine nature of, of, of work. Um, in one essay, he actually engages in this very interesting diatribe against Bentham, and particularly the notion of, the great, of, of utilitarian happiness, um, where he says that the very notion of happiness is, is kind of a corrupt idea. Um, it's an ignoble concept. We shouldn't be happy. Um, the only happiness a grave man ever troubled himself with asking much about, this is a quote, obviously, uh, was happiness enough to get his work done. All work, even cotton spinning, is noble. Work alone is noble be it here said and asserted once more, in like manner too, all dignity is painful. A life of ease is not for any man. Our highest religion is named the worship of sorrow. For the son of man, there is no noble crown, well-worn or even ill-worn, but there is a crown of thorns. So um, there was a very explicit idea that the suffering is part of the essential nature of work and ennobles it. Um, Bentham and the utilitarians, uh, who saw no purpose in human life other than the pursuit of pleasure, they started with happiness and then they kind of moved it to good, um, can be seen as the philosophical ancestors of modern consumerism, which is still justified by an economic theory of utility. Uh, but Carlyle's perspective isn't really the negation of Bentham's. Or if it is, then only in the dialectical sense, where the two apparent opposites remain permanently at war, their advocates unaware that in their struggle, they constitute a higher unity, which would be impossible without each. Um, the belief that what ultimately motivates human beings has always been and must always be been the pursuit of wealth, power, comforts, and pleasure has always and must always be complemented by a doctrine of work as self-sacrifice, as valuable precisely because it's the place of misery, satan, sadism, emptiness, and despair. So this is depressing. I'm going to end on a happy note. <laughs> um, caring. <laughs> um, now, I think the very fact that so many people recognize our work to be pointless and are so concerned about the matter, and the indignation over the fact that people are effectively punished for seeking employment that actually helps others, can be seen as marking the beginning of a reformulation of the very idea of what a working class actually is, and always has been. Um, as Marx himself pointed out in, in volume three of Capital, which no one reads. Uh, oh, actually, no, this is in the Foreman. Uh, yeah, I, I have another one from volume three. Um, until the emergence of capitalism, it never occurred to anyone to write a book about the conditions that would create the most wealth. They argued about the conditions that would create the best people. And, even if one does see the world in productivist terms, the production of commodities is ultimately a subordinate moment in the production of human beings. The ultimate pathology of capitalism is actually that it sees social reproduction as an adjunct to material production rather than the other way around. You know, we think that we have an educational system to help the economy. Really, we should think we have an economy to help the educational system. You know, we're supposed to know things about the world. That's life, right? Um, but increasingly, social struggles in wealthy countries focus specifically on the terms of human production. In the US, and this is true in a lot of places around the world, I know about the US best, in quite a number of large cities, the two largest employers are universities and hospitals, uh, which can be imagined uh, in these terms as factories for human production, divided in good Cartesian fashion between mind and body, right? Uh, and if you look at right-wing populism, again, um, you know, it's got its creationist side and its anti-abortion campaigns. Well, you know, it's actually taking direct aim at those portions of what they call the liberal elite who control each, you know, who control the hospitals and who control the educational systems. It's, it's, it's very strategic if you think about it. Um, on the other hand, it's also very clear that this is something of a rear guard action. Since 
if again, we're taking America, and I think it's true in most places, the mainstream left is really just as firmly in control of the apparatus of human production as the mainstream right is in control of the means of production of material goods. Realistically, the prospect of right-wing populists in America actually resting control of universities and hospitals is about as great as the prospect of a socialist party taking power in America and collectivizing heavy industry. Um, neither one is ever going to happen. We have a standoff. Um, in this way, the situation appears to be a kind of balance of power um, in America as in much of the contemporary world. So if so, the strategic question from the perspective of a left revolutionary such as myself uh, is exactly how could what I've called the caring classes, who are the people who staff these institutions for the production of people, um, the travailleurs empathique or the courgeoisie, you know, how could they break through this impasse uh, and effectively become the vehicle for what, to borrow a term from the Italian autonomous tradition, we might call the recomposition of the working class as a whole. It's certainly true that labor mobilizations in Europe and North America have increasingly centered on those whose work involves the benevolent shaping of others and the maintenance of benevolent environments. Uh, hospital workers, teachers, cleaners, uh, nursing home workers here, I recently in France have struck for the first time. One might call these the proletariat of these factories for the production of people. And if it's really true that digitization and robotization threaten to eliminate an increasing number of jobs and it's, it's not in those sections. And I think this is actually very interesting that those kinds of carrying class jobs are going to become more important over time and more fields of struggle because there is a contradiction in what happens when you digitize and robotize labor. Uh, it is true that if you're sorting fruit, if you're creating microchips, then robots are gonna make you more productive, more efficient, and it's gonna cause what they call technological deflation. There's an actually lowering of prices. Quality goes up high enough that you don't notice it as much. Uh, but there is technological deflation going on. On the other hand, if you try to apply the same robotization and computerization techniques to anything involving what I call carrying labor in this more extensive sense, well, the exact opposite happens. Because you know, people like me have to spend half our time translating what are essentially qualitative experiences into something that a computer can actually understand. And that has to be done by human labor, and it takes enormous amounts of human labor. And so you have this increasing bullshitization of actual job, you know, real labor, especially carrying professions. And nurses in America have to spend 60% of their time doing paperwork. Um, and that, of course, lowers productivity per worker and causes inflation. So needless to say, the price of education, the price of health in the economy keeps going up. So this will make this much more and more a, a, a arena of struggle. The problem in terms of social struggle is that this means that the real enemies of the caring classes, their immediate opponents, uh, are, are not their bosses so much as their administrators, the people who are actually forcing this digitization on them. Um, so, so, you know, if you are a, a nurse, you know, your great enemy are the hospital administrators. If you're a teacher, your great enemy are the school administrators. But because of the peculiar nature of political changes, um, those guys are supposed to be on the same side. So that in American teachers' unions, the, the, the teachers and the school administrators are actually represented in the same union. So how do you strike against those guys? You can't. Um, how do you really oppose them? Uh, similarly, the political, what are still considered le mainstream left political parties, largely ditched the working class, as Tom Franks has recently pointed out. Um, it, in the, starting in the 70s, it was quite strategic, and gone sort of embraced the professional managerial classes. So you have finance sort of backing up these left uh, parties, and then you have the professional managerial classes, their base constituency. You know, they are the enemy, basically, um, from the terms of the caring classes, but those, that's supposed to be your party. It's a terrible dilemma. Um, so the practical problem is how to overcome that. Um, new institutional forms also have to involve new conceptions of the value of labor. And, and here, I think, is a first step. I think we're going to have to, I mean, I've ta been talking about the production of human beings, but I, don't, I think that's a stopgap. If we're going to really think about what's happening here, we need to transcend that very notion of production of human beings or otherwise, and move beyond the theology of creation as suffering or otherwise, and, Yes, this is indeed my conclusion. <laughs> um, not to worry. <laughs> um, and um, 
Here, the work of feminist theories of caring and caring labor are critical, um, ranging from the Marxist feminist tradition of Leopoldina de Fortunati, Mario Rosa de la Costa, Silvia Federici, Selma James, uh, newer but no less important figures like Bev Skeggs, economists like Nancy Fulbra, uh, theorists of ethics or practice of, of caring, such as Gilligan, Noddings, Ruddock, Held, Tronto. Um, the somewhat ludic version of caring theory I'm going to be presenting is also developed in part with the feminist theorist Erica Lagalis. Um, as Fulbra notes, all labor can be conceived as caring labor in the sense that it helps meet the needs of others. So, you know, even building a bridge, you build a bridge because you care people can cross the river, right? Um, now, a key aspect of caring is it's about the creation and maintenance of relationships and a rejection of the patriarchal ideal of autonomy for an acceptance of interdependency. But at the same time, it's also a rejection in the feminist tradition of the more empathic projection of self and uh, onto another. Uh, it, it rather encourages a self-effacing openness to the reality of others and their needs and desires. All this implies that caring is not actually a value, but the prime means for the creation of value. And it's easy to see that almost all working class labor already involves such a caring element, at least as much and generally much more so than a productive one. But then the question has to become, what precisely is it? What form of value that's being produced? And there's a great deal of difference in the feminist literature. People talk about growth, needs, flourishing, interests, depending on the psychological, philosophical, or economic disciplinary tradition they're coming from. I'm going to end by giving my own idiosyncratic suggestion. It seems to me that caring labor is best conceived as labor that is directed, ultimately, at maintaining or enhancing another's freedom. The existing literature actually tends to avoid talking about freedom too much because it sees freedom in patriarchal liberal terms essentially as autonomy uh, and thus opposed to the notion of interdependency, but um, thus actually the opposite of caring relations. But I don't think that's the only possible definition of freedom. And here's where I'm going to end by talking about Marx's volume three, where he talks about leaving the domain of necessity. Communism will mean leaving the domain of necessity for the domain of freedom. And he says, freedom is labor, action, creative, or otherwise. It's performed not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. But action for its own sake could be considered not only the definition of freedom, but also a very common definition of play. An argument could be made that the principle of freedom, as the expression of powers for their own sake, exists on every level of physical reality. And this could allow us to extend caring, you know, the problem with the labor theory of values productivists is, you know, it, 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 it's this kind of Promethean uh, productivism it can lead to terrible ecological results. But, um, you know, this notion of caring can be towards the environment and, and non-human beings as well. Um, and the idea of play does exist, I think, on every level of, of material reality. Um, facilitating such play, ensuring and maintaining the possibility of it is the ultimate aim of caring labor. This seat might seem odd, but consider you know, the paradigm for caring labor is maternal labor, right? What are mothers taking care of children so that the children can do? Mostly play. Um, so you know, would, this is not just biological needs or a process of growth, well, although play, of course, is part of a process of growth as well. Um, so mothers take care of children, feed, clean them, protect them in order to provide an environment which facilitates play, that is, it, the children's freedom. Um, and that's an integral, and also play with them themselves is an integral part of the caring relation. Um, so play is a key element in children's discovery of world and growth, but it's not just that. It's also an end in itself. So this is what I'd like to end by suggesting. Ra where we have a, an idea of production and consumption, which comes out of economics and is embraced even in most of those uh, discourses posed against it, uh, I think we could reconceive value creating labor, at, it, not in terms of production and consumption, but between as care and, and, and freedom, and freedom as play. Uh, such a view is already tacit in people's sense of social value or lack of it in their own labor. And if teased out and developed in the same way that theorists like Marx teased out and developed the full implications of productive, the productivist version of the labor theory of value embraced by working class people in his own day, it could have profound implications for how we view every aspect of the economy. Even more, perhaps, if translated into a theoretical common sense in the same way that the productivist version of the labor theory of value was in the 19th century, it has potentially revolutionary implications in every sense of the term. <laughs>
Thank you, David, for this very lively and uh, dense uh, uh, <laughs> talk. Uh, we don't have much time left. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, but so rather than asking you uh, questions or having a conversation of what you just said, I had the privilege of reading the manuscript of the book, so, uh, and it's very convincing. I uh, really uh, hope that most of you will be able to read it, either in English or in French, because it's- It should come out in French in September. It's coming in, in, in September. So rather than asking questions precisely on what you said, I would like to um, uh, entice you uh, 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 on a reflection on your own approach. You know? In particular, we are both anthropologists, and on the relationship between, uh, let's say, critical thought and anthropology. Um, th there is a, in, in 1938, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss gave a, a lecture to a think tank of the CGT. The CGT was the major mm -hmm. yeah. trade union at the time, and uh, it was in the midst of a power struggle between the SFEO, the Socialist, and the Communist Party. Mm. And uh, in this talk, uh, it developed the argument that uh, uh, anthropology is a revolutionary science, not in the sense of a Copernican revolution, but in the sense of a Marxist-Leninist revolution. And why was that? Because, uh, in fact, anthropology provides us with a gaze from afar, and it allows us to see our own institutions from a distance, uh, and thus to be able to e e extract ourselves from the immediacy of these institutions. And I think you made the same argument in your book, um, uh, a Fragment of an Anarchist Anthropology, did, yeah. uh, where um, anthropology is in a position, you say, to describe uh, different universe, different worlds, and uh, different forms of social organization that work pretty well, in fact, for the people who are uh, living within these worlds, so, and in particular among stateless societies. So my, my, my question would be, uh, and it's a personal question in a way, um, would you say that comparative anthropology is uh, not only a critical tool in that sense, uh, and, and, and Levis Ross and you and I and a number of people have already said that, but also a sort of springboard mm -hmm. for imagining new forms of collectives, new form of aggregation, new form of being together. Mm. Um, and hence, anthropologists would have a sort of political responsibility for uh, providing, not necessarily new models, but helping people to imagine mm. new directions in which to project themselves in order to escape from the present. Uh, and. Uh, would, so what would you say to that? Because I understand that you are, I mean, your, your tendency, you are leaning towards anarchism and so, and the spontaneity of the masses. So would you re re reject such uh, a, a possibility for mm -hmm. us uh, uh, of suggesting, uh, imagining uh, new oh. possibilities? Oh, not at all. Um, I, I actually... What I always say about utopianism is there's nothing wrong with utopianism unless you only have one. <laughs> you know, it's, it's multiple utopias is great. You know, um, the, more, the more conceptions you have. Uh, I always say I'm, I'm not in the business of, of telling people what sort of economic system, what sort of political system they should have. Um, what I am about is creating the situation where they can decide for themselves what sort of mm -hmm. economic or political mm -hmm. uh, system they have, which they don't have now. But you know, the more visions of utopia you have, the more power they have to think about those things or to choose that. Um, I always talk about my, my parents. My parents were working class intellectuals and they were considered themselves radicals. Um, but I always noticed that they didn't really have any books in the house of critiquing capitalism. I think they had one volume of Marx, kind of felt they had to. Um, but they, they didn't have, they didn't need to, anybody to tell them why capitalism was horrible. They worked nine to five. Um, they had lots of books of anthropology, history, and science fiction. Mm. Um, you know, they, they didn't want to know about capitalism. When they went home and read, they wanted to read about something completely different uh, and imagine what that would be like. And, and one of the things I was most proud of when I, I wrote the book on debt um, 
the, the review I was most, or the blog I was most proud of, was someone who wrote a blog, a science fiction writer said, I think this is the book I found with the most good ideas for science fiction writers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and apparently it has been, a lot of stuff in there has been used. Um, so yeah, I think that, that it is exactly as you say, it's an historical responsibility. We are the guardians of a compendium of knowledge of human possibility. And one of the ways that neoliberal capitalism has managed to, to operate, despite the fact that it creates outcomes that no one really likes very much, has been through a war on the human imagination, has been on a, you know, intentionally trying to squelch any sense of alternative possibilities. I mean, when I, as an anthropologist, you know, I say, well, there's a thousand ways to organize an economy. And people, of course, will immediately say, well, yeah, but I mean, those people are primitive, you know? Um, to which I always reply, so are you saying if you're carting around grain in an ox cart, there's 27 different ways to organize an economy, but if you've got computers, there's only one? I thought technology was supposed to give us more power and choices, mm. not less. Mm. It confuses people a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the, well, um, Marshall Salins, uh, whom we mentioned several times, mm. it was in Paris, uh, as you mentioned, uh, during the yeah. uh, uh, here, and he wrote a, a piece which had a huge success uh, uh, in uh, Les Temps Modernes, not in a in a professional journal, mm. Les Premières Sociétés d'Abondance, where he showed that foragers mm. uh, walk uh, uh, three between or four two hours, or three yeah. hours, yeah. Or yeah. perhaps four hours mm -hmm. a day. Uh, and have, uh, enjoy a, a, a nice standard of living. <laughs> and uh, that was my experience also going to the field with the atrows. Mm. Walk about three hours a day, and it's your experience in, in Madagascar also. Mm. And so uh, in this, this uh, kind of technical analysis, because it's a very learned uh, article no, with uh, statistics of mm. work, labor involvement, et cetera, et cetera, and productivity of, of work in terms of the, the kind of food that is accessible, et cetera, uh, had a, a very important effect uh, uh, in, in terms of critic, critics precisely of modern production uh, in, in the sense that you defined it mm. as something that is must be rowed out of uh, <laughs> uh, 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 an assembly line, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And um, I, I think that even if you do not uh, extract from what you are doing as an anthropologist uh, uh, consequences, mm -hmm. the very uh, uh, notion that you can contrast forms of being together mm -hmm. uh, and ex maint having a, a, a maintaining a subsistence in some places in a very, very different way from the one we, we, we have is in itself rather radical and revolutionary. Um, mm. But there's one aspect that in your book, uh, which, which, which is a very interesting because it's a, at the end, it's, it's the conclusion. Uh, I, I would like, we have very little time, so perhaps this will be my last question. It's on the universal basic, basic income. income. Yeah. Um, you say you dislike making policy propositions, no? <laughs> so, but yes, as anthropologists, we can paint different worlds and propose perhaps uh, ima imagining yes. uh, uh, different solutions, but not making uh, policy proposition in, in particular because people uh, will reduce your account mm -hmm. of a problem, the main part of a problem, to uh, an account of a possible solution. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but above all, your reluctance to uh, propose um, a, a policy proposition is because a policy uh, implies the existence of an elite that gets to decide or, on something or to impose something mm -hmm. uh, on everybody else. Nevertheless, you speak very highly of the uh, uh, universal basic okay. income. And of course, the universal basic income requires some form of centrality. It requires institutions that will collect funds mm. and redistribute funds. I, I, I've, I, I've been, Absolutely. I, I'm getting, I've, I have more and more sympathy for this idea of the universal basic income, mm -hmm. I must say, personally. But of course, it implies a sort of form of centrality. So how would you reconcile 
uh, your, well, spontaneity <laughs> of the masses, etc., et mm. with the necessity of uh, having institutions that would uh, be able to cope with this mm. necessity of redistributing uh, income. Yeah, well, I mean, it's spontaneity is a term that anarchists don't actually use. It's largely a term that, that Marxists use about anarchists. Um, we don't actually see ourselves as spontaneous. Uh, it's, we see ourselves more as about bottom-up direct democracy, for example. So, so it is definitely the case, however, that, um, that you know, so creating organizations and institutions um, is, is not a problem at all. Uh, Top-down imposition through co bureaucracies of coercion is, is, is what we're objecting to. So first of all, any sort of something that looks like a reform or even a centralized institution that could be maintained without bureaucracies of coercion, uh, coercion in the physical sense of the term, you know, could be consistent with a broadly anarchist position. I think of, of universal basic income essentially as a transitional demand because it is a leftist anti-bureaucratic. Um, I, I, should, I should emphasize here that there's different forms of, uh, of, of universal basic income, and there's right-wing versions of it which are pretty horrific, and I, I don't want to, anybody to think that I am embracing the idea that we should go give everybody cash and then get rid of um, universal health care for example. Um, uh, what I am saying is one should expand the degree of unconditionality by giving people the means of, of life support. And, um, and it should be given to everyone uniformly. Uh, that's the key uh, without any conditions. But the key thing about this is that if you look at the state, um, much of the state bureaucracy, I mean, it seems like increasing numbers of, 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 of civil servants basically exist to make poor people feel bad about themselves, um, you know, to constantly surveil them and impose rules on them and to make them miserable. And, and those are both the most intrusive and the most obnoxious aspects of the state. And they're exactly the ones that would vanish the moment you have unconditional basic income. Because you wouldn't need all those people to see like whether you're really using that room or whether you're really married or whether you're really, you know, or all those things that they do which drive people crazy. Um, and those people are, are very unhappy as well. Because one of the things that I discovered in um, a lot of the, the, the communications I got to my informants about bullshit jobs were people who were in the jobs where you know, their job was to see if a homeless person had three forms of ID and kick them out on the street if they didn't, and they were miserable. They felt, you know, all those people where you ask themselves how can they live with themselves, a lot of them can't. Um, they suffer a lot, and, and um, those people wouldn't have to do it either. You know, they'd, be, they'd get basic income too, and, and they could go form a band or something, or do something useful with their life. <laughs> um, and um, I think that, um, you know, so it would be a way of massively reducing um, existing bureaucracy. It would require some sort of centralized or central bank or um, government mechanism, but the ultimate effect would be a transitional mechanism moving towards a notion of universal human freedom, in this case, to decide how you want to contribute to the world. And the other thing I, I think is very important to point out in this regard is that what I, I think that my findings about bullshit jobs is one of the greatest arguments for universal basic income, because one of the, you know there's two immediate objections people will have, practical objections. Some people object morally to the idea, but practical objections. One of them is, well, if you give people money, they're just going to sit around watching TV all day. Mm. Well, clearly that's not true, because I mean the very fact that people are paid to do nothing and basically watch YouTube all day are so unhappy. Um, you know, indicates that people actually want to be doing something they think is contributing to the world. I mean, yeah, there'll be a few who will slack off, so what? Um, it's a small price for human freedom. Um, the, the second is that people will work, but they'll do something stupid. Um, so you're going to have thousands of bad poets and annoying street mimes and bad bands and, you know, and, and crank scientific theorists wandering around, and, um, and, and, and nothing will get done. Um, however, at this point, 40% of all workers think they're already doing nothing. How could it be any worse than we've already got? <laughs> so I think that's one of the strongest arguments you could possibly have for basic income. I'm turning to my, my, 
The administrator, shall we conclude? <laughs> yes. Well, the conclusion is, is obvious. If you want to change the world, read the anthropology. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs>